I really broke my teeth on a series of cases that arose out of uh, a large demonstration against the National Front in 1977. Um, there was a large number of arrests and uh, those who'd been arrested who were almost entirely anti-fascists were processed through Lambeth Magistrates Court and they just did about five cases day in and day out. And uh, I was involved in a number of those cases and it was a great opportunity to get some experience doing real advocacy. It, it taught me that I wanted to defend, not prosecute. Um, uh, it was a great training opportunity because it was it was real it wasn't pretend it wasn't in a classroom setting this was for real and winning cases meant people didn't go to prison in those days perhaps more than now most of those who were convicted for offenses for example assault on police would almost automatically get a prison sentence so getting them off was a, uh, a big thing you know, I got a real buzz out single influence that I can put it down to is that I was a young teenager in the mid-1960s and I remember watching footage of uh, black people in the southern states of the US being beaten by racist police officers and attacked with dogs for daring to say we're human beings, we ought to be treated equally and I was horrified by what I saw and I thought then I don't know quite how I'll do it but I want to I know which side I'm on and I want to try and be on the side of people who are standing up for themselves against the state. Uh, consider we live in a civilised modern democracy and the hallmark to me of a civilised society is how it treats not the people who are well to do, who are uh, necessarily find life easy and how it treats those who, for various reasons, sometimes not their own fault, are at the bottom of the pile. And I think that uh, the way in which people's rights are protected, um, whether it be asylum seekers, tenants in housing, uh, workers in the workplace, or those who are prosecuted by the state, I think it's a hallmark of the civilised society that those people get as good representation as the state gets. I'm currently working on a case that involves um, a kidnapping and blackmail of a uh, student, a Chinese student, who was uh, kidnapped by some fellow Chinese nationals who demanded a ransom from his parents. Uh, largely it seems because he was unwise enough to brag about how wealthy his parents were. And what rather amused me was that these are all Chinese nationals who come over from the People's Republic. Uh, and I couldn't help thinking, well, being brought up as good communists, they obviously thought there ought to be a bit of redistribution of wealth. <laughs> and so they were trying to redistribute yeah. a bit of his wealth. But um, being serious about it, mean, it's, it's, a, it's a serious case because uh, there, were, there was a series of phone calls made. It was a, it was a, a, a genuine kidnapping and blackmail that went on, but it's, uh, uh, it's still ongoing at the moment, so I can't really say any more about it. Um, I love reading, which may seem a bit strange, bearing in mind that I spend most of my working life reading, but it's reading for pleasure that I still enjoy most. I'm, uh, I have a quirky um, uh, degree, as you know, and I'm rather proud of the fact, I doubt if there are any other members of the bar who've actually got a, a degree in Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic studies. And it's still my hobby. And I love reading um, uh, stuff to do with uh, the early history of the, of, of the, the British Isles. I like real ale. And I like red wine, but it's a hard call. Uh, we have a, a restaurant in Sheffield that I go to which is called Marco's at Milano's and it's, it's Italian contemporary international sort of cuisine but it's excellent. It's uh, Crete. I have a golf. See, I mean, 
you were expecting somebody like me to say I drive, drive a, a 7 Series BMW. And I'm not impressed by it. Like, I like Golfs. They're great cars to get you from A to B. They're reliable as, as anything. They always start. It has a, a wheel at each corner and that will... Probably um, teaching. I think I would have wanted to do something, if I hadn't gone into law at all, if I would have probably wanted to do something teaching-wise relating to history. Uh, the best thing is the sense of satisfaction from doing a case well. It doesn't always mean winning, although obviously if you win, um, I suppose that's an, an obvious bonus, not least of all for your client. Um, but you get tremendous satisfaction out of knowing you've done the job well. And I guess, as I say, winning is probably the pinnacle of that. Um, the worst thing is probably having to deal with um, prison staff, I would say. Going in and out of prisons and custody areas at courts, they're usually surly, miserable people who are um, probably underpaid and don't like their job and seem to want to take it out on everyone they come into contact with. I always remember, um, I mean, I, I, I had, uh, I could remember that when the, before Tony Blair came to power, um, everybody I sort of met in roving rooms and so on would complain about home secretaries like Michael Howard because they seemed to be so reactionary. And Tony Blair's slogan was that they were going to get tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime, um, which I took to mean that they had some interest in trying to, to deal with the root causes of crime. What is it that makes people commit crime? And it didn't seem to take very long before that started to morph into something which I've characterised as being tough on crime and tough on those accused of crime because Labour, their, their first, more or less their first act, at least in relation to the criminal law, was the, um, the Crime and Disorder Act of 1998 which introduced the whole concept of ASBOs and uh, so on. But they then went on in a series of measures, all of which were designed to make life more difficult for those who are on trial accused of a criminal offence and more likely to result in convictions. And you have to go back to the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984 to find the last criminal statute that actually introduced measures designed to assist those who were charged with crime. It revolutionised procedure in police stations. It stopped police officers from the old practice that was called verbaling, where they would literally put words into people's mouths and claim that someone had confessed to a crime that they uh, evidently hadn't. Um, but since then, and that's 26 years ago, that I can't think of a single, never mind a single act, I can't think of a single provision in any act which has actually been put in in order to assist those who are on trial. And I think what, what I was disgusted by as the Labour government unfolded was that it was quite obvious that various Home Secretaries were much more concerned about the reaction they would get from the editorial office of the Daily Mail or the Sun than they were about doing what seemed to be right. And Naive it may be, but I think I, along with a lot of people, would look to the Labour Party as being more likely to understand why people commit offences and more likely to feel some degree of sympathy towards their plight. And what was happening was that they were actually turning out to be even more right-wing than previous Tory Home Secretaries. Um, it, it was a Tory Home Secretary who once said that sending people to prison is, a, is an expensive way of making bad people worse. And Labour seemed to completely turn that on its head with ideas about these so-called titan jails that they were going to build and just seemed to be 
happy to see the prison population skyrocket. I mean, it, it went up enormously in the 13 years of, of the Labour government. Um, coupled with what seemed to me to be a complete disregard for the rule of law, which is at the centre of, of any civilised legal system. Uh, I, I cannot understand how any government that has the slightest idea what the rule of law means could have ever contemplated locking people up for as long as three months without charge because they didn't have enough evidence but somebody suspected that they might be involved possibly in something to do with terrorism. And whilst we're all concerned for our own security, um, and I don't look at these things lightly. I use the tube, my children use the tube, I'm just as concerned about people's safety as anyone. I think for a, for a Labour government to have got itself into a situation where it was actively thinking about 90 days detention without trial in circumstances like that was disgraceful and showed that they had just had either contempt for the rule of law or I suspect had simply forgotten that it, the concept even continued to exist. too many people are sent to prison, even, even now after years of apparently government saying that uh, prisons shouldn't be dumping grounds, they shouldn't be used for uh, minor offences. Um, it, it's, um, it's difficult in the current sort of arrangement of society to think of a better way of dealing with serious violent criminals, serious sexual offenders than to lock them up. Although. It has to be said that it's a, a bit of a, um, a, a final resort, really. If you, if you can't think of anything better to do with people than just to sort of tip them into a prison. But there are still thousands of people who go to prison, usually for very, sh well, a lot of them for short periods, which does nothing other than to possibly lose them a job or lose them their house. But they don't get any training, they don't get any aftercare, and it, it is just um, a pointless exercise and certainly doesn't help them to rehabilitate because, um, I mean, there obviously are people who do commit very serious offences such as uh, violence and, and sexual offences and I guess we simply don't have the resources available to really understand what it is about people that causes them to commit those kind of offences. I suspect that the incidence of mental illness amongst prisoners is massively understated um, because ordinary people don't commit violent offences. They don't fly off the handle and, and assault somebody in a, in a particularly serious way. They don't rape and commit serious sexual offences unless there's something wrong about their personality. Um, but leaving those to one side, far too many people are sent to prison who shouldn't be and who could be uh, better dealt with within the community. I mean, for years uh, I've heard um, people say that um, the cost of locking somebody up is far more than the cost of any of these community schemes. But I still don't understand why it is that if that's the case, more of these community schemes aren't provided. Because you can't say it's a funding issue. Because if they're happy to spend the money on locking people up, then it's just, it's just a question of making a choice. And Let's be honest, we all know, again going back to the point I was making earlier on, law and order is a very political issue and governments are always terrified of having headlines about them being soft on crime. And so they're frightened about being seen to be sponsoring something other than the obvious lock them up sort of approach. Um, even if ironically in the long run that actually means more crime uh, and more expense. Um, there are lots of imaginative schemes that probation officers have developed over the years that are designed to divert people away from crime. There are various courses that uh, are available, a, a number of which are run in prisons, but they could equally be run in uh, as part of a non-custodial sentence. Uh, and um, more imaginative ways of getting people to pay back to the society that they've wronged than, than locking them up.